How you doing, guys? It's Mick Tully with Woman TV, and I'm with Sheehan Gavin Mulholland. So, Gavin, first of all, thank you for talking to us. Now, Pleasure. Is there any chance that you just quickly will start at the beginning? How did you get into martial arts? Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, and I don't have the full answer, to be honest, because... Um, my dad was in the military, and we're, we're from Belfast, we're a uh, Northern Irish family, uh, four brothers, one sister, and he was teaching um, a sort of combination of judo and um, unarmed combat as a kind of military um, civilian crossover, because at the time this was like, this would be 60s, late 60s, early 60s, uh, 70s in Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland and of course, everything's kicking off again over there. So this was quite interesting that he was doing this crossover um, thing, which was a kind of civilian uh, military crossover, and it had Catholics and Protestants all training together. So that was quite a big deal. But so we all went there and, and watched, and and we all trained from then. So I don't actually remember a time when I wasn't training because I don't think I was ever given that option. So yeah. it all started from there, and then and then carried on. First of all, when you got into karate and you trained, what what is it that got you to go juru karate out of all of the karate styles? So that was a, that was a bit of good fortune as these things are. I don't know. Maybe people these days do choose a system, but I don't think anyone chose a system back in the day because there wasn't enough of it around to choose anything. You just went and did thing. I didn't. I didn't really know of a great deal of um, different systems. I don't think there's a great deal around. But what, what actually shifted me, because I was doing some judo at the time, and I'd sort of got a bit um, a bit tired of that, really. I was still doing it, but, but I was disappointed my dad because he was a big judo fan. He loved it, and he took us he took us sort of every weekend, of course, which you don't appreciate when you're a kid, but, but I do now. I'm the one having to charge people around. <laughs> And I saw this demo. Now, it, it was a demo which had uh, Kim Roberts and Dave Arnold in. Now, they were some of the original Goju people. I think Dave was in the British team, even with Bob Breen, back when Bob Breen was still doing karate and in the British team. And and this demo, I'd, it was at a school fete or something. And, and I just happened to be there. And, and these guys got up to do karate, and it was loud, and, and uh, I, you know, I was shouting a lot. And then they did the bit on, on self-defense where I think it was Kim went to hit Dave with a chair, and Dave wasn't looking or something, and, and Kim just broke the chair over him, and Dave just went mental. And they just, <laughs> listen, <laughs> they just, they just had this big scrap in front of these kids. And so I must, by then, I guess I must have been about 17 at this stage. And, uh, and it was brilliant. And it was absolutely yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I think it was on the Isle of Wight, but I spoke to Dave recently, and he doesn't think it was. So, but, so it was down south. And, uh, and I thought that was fantastic. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but Dave Arnold was teaching on the Isle of Wight, and Kim was teaching in Southampton. And I was living down on the coast then. We'd moved down there from Scotland. We left Ireland, went to Scotland. We were five years in Scotland, then down to England. And um, so I went up to Kim, who was the more dynamic of the two. And, uh, and I went to speak to him to ask him and ask, you know, where he trains, how he joins, everything. I spoke to him, and he just looked at me up and down and turned his back and walked off. <laughs> he didn't answer me. He just walked. And I was... I was a bit gossiping, and then Dave Arnold, who was the other half of their operation, said, don't mind him, he's a miserable git or something, and spoke to me about it. But it was Kim that I was going to have to train with. And uh, so I just followed up on that and, and went to Kim's club, and and it was it was exactly what I wanted it to be. He was They were hard, they were frightening, he was distant, and he was brilliant. You've been quoted as saying that you literally only started to have a conversation with him or get on conversational terms when you got to about a brown belt. Yeah, and then, right. And and you thought he, he just he didn't like you or he was just trying to get you out. And then it, the distant thing is quite interesting that you said that because it, I don't know if we watch too many movies, men of our generation, 
but the <laughs> mentor figure that we wanted we didn't want we didn't want the father they don't talk to you do they no from there what made you like create dkk so dkk came about so so there was three of us at the time so um so around 87 i think i was an engineer at the time and i had my own house and stuff and i was 26 i think so i've done i was well on the path that people set themselves on and and i was lucky in that i got it that young so i was able to realize this isn't it whereas most people i think are in their 40s before they get you know a good job and a house and then they know holy fuck this is, you know, this isn't it there's more to life than this i, I decided I, I was going to leave the country and go traveling and um i was a bit nervous about telling my mom and dad about this because i had you know a good job good house and, and this was really a big moment for me because when i told my dad and mum, they were just like, brilliant, yeah, right, off you go. Cool, and dad, cool. said, he go, dad said to me, he goes, yeah, that's not the last, last house you'll ever have. That's not the last job you'll ever have. He said, it's nice to look over the edge and see where you're going to land, son. He said, but sometimes you just have to jump and trust you're going to land, and you will. And so, so I'd, left, uh, I'd left Kim's club by then. I was about second Dan by this stage, and I'd left and went and ended up in Japan and, and all that stuff. And... I went away for six months and came back two years later, that sort of thing. And um, so I, I came back and I, I had gone to university. So I, when I was at school, I didn't even know anyone that had been to university. I didn't, they, those people didn't exist, um, not from my school anyway. And so I had this view of people who are at university as these sort of, you know, really mega brainy things. And what was interesting is when I was traveling, so I was in Australia, actually, I remember when this happened. I met a bunch of English boys that were traveling and I thought, but you're thick as shit. I think I could do that. So I actually apply, applied from Australia to, to do a degree in England. And, uh, and I didn't even I wanted to do psychology, but that was only because I picked up a psychology book in a, in a hostel where people leave books, you know, when they're traveling on. And I read that because I'd read everything I possibly could and still do. Uh, and so I'd spoke to my dad about it and he was going to help. And I said, look, I want to do psychology, but I will study anything. I don't care what it is. I just want to study something to that depth. I only have one condition. Any university, any subject, just not London. And so you can't say that because the gods hear you, right? So I ended yeah, up in yeah. London, <laughs> moving to London, and I've never left. But what happened was, so I went to university and I tried all the martial arts there. and and um, uh, I didn't like them very much, I think it's fair to say. And I, I, again, I remember the actual moment, and it was doing it. It was a, a taekwondo club, and we're knuckle push ups, but four inches off, right? And the instructor said this was invented by this taekwondo master who'd got stuck on a cliff. He's climbing a cliff, but he got stuck on it, and he was there overnight. And so I thought, A, no, he didn't. And B, if he did, that's not the right exercise, is it? <laughs> so, so I went to the students' union and said, look, um, can I start a karate club and start up with about six people showed up? And so that's how it is. So I sort of reluctantly started teaching. I didn't go to want to teach. I was going to train. But I didn't find anything that was going to be challenging enough. I've digressed a little bit. So at that time, Kim was associate, but Kim went abroad. He moved to France. And we did about a year or so with him in France. And then myself and Dan Lewis, who runs DKK with me, and a guy called Stuart, who's no longer involved, I wrote to Kim. I did the right thing. And, and it made a lot of difference because there's others of our ilk who didn't do the right thing. And, and I said to Kim, look, we're not, we're splitting. I'm setting up DKK. We're not going to license through you next year. I don't know how you're going to react to this. I said, but however you react to this, you're all you're welcome in any dojo I ever run, and you're always welcome in my home. And um, I got a letter back from him, you know, really very very supportive, saying he'd always be there when I needed him. He's there, etc. So, so that that's how DKK split. And I, and I can and I think what DKK was about evolved after it had begun. And 
it, it came about really. It's all right for me to just keep rabbiting yeah, on. Is that? Okay, there, so there, there was a, a couple of, of real key incidents. I, I, I might have even told you some of this previously, but there was a couple of real incidents that changed everything for me. Um, one was a, a novel that I read, and this book changed everything for me. And what's most interesting is I don't know what the name of the book is. I don't know the author. And it's it's not a – it was a cheapo novel, again, that I'd just picked up somewhere. And the, the story arc of this book was there was an Irish priest in Italy. They're escaping over the, the Alps. A, a, a convict has kidnapped an Irish priest, and they're escaping over the mountains in an old banger car. And the, the convict tells the priest, and he says, I don't believe in God. And the priest says, all right, tell me about this God you don't believe in. He goes, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, tell me about it. He goes, well, I don't believe in some old man with a big beard sitting on a cloud. And the priest said, all right, I don't believe in him either. And that, <laughs> that changed. That was one of my light bulb moments in my life because it comes down to everything. Everything comes back to that. Someone says, I don't believe in karate. Right, which bit doesn't work? The head butt or the knee and the bollocks? What do you mean when you say it doesn't work? What do you? What doesn't work? Oh, well, you punch. Oh, right, I don't believe in that either. You know, you've got to fight. But for, so it did for me, you've got to define. If you're going to say something, you have to define it. You know, I don't believe in God. Yeah. Which God? You know, which one? I don't believe in that one either. So that was, that was kind of amazing for me. That was a big moment. The other one was when I was at university. Uh... And I had to write this big sort of treatise on Freud. And, and I put a lot into this. And, and uh, I was called into the professor, and, uh, which is always great. Because I, I, you know, one of the things you should do in life is surround yourself with people who are better than you are at everything. Yeah. You know, if you're, the, if you're the brightest one in the room, I can't remember who said it, you're in the wrong room, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so I was going to see it. And he said, I've, I've read this, Gavin. He said, um, did you read any Freud? I said, yeah. Yeah, 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 I did, yeah. He goes, oh, right, did you read any Freud? I said, yeah, there's a bibliography at the back. There's about 12 books that I'd read, cover to cover. And he didn't look down. He just went, yeah, did you read any Freud? I'm like, and it dawned on what he meant, or what I'd done, is I'd read 12 books on Freud, and I had not read Freud. I'd read other people's opinions of it. And he said to me, always, always go to source. That's what DKK became, because the other thing struck me. So my main instructors have been Steve, uh, have been uh, Kim Roberts, Dick Hughes, and um, Steve Morris, right? And, and they're all exceptional. They're unbelievably good violent men. Whoopass. In, in the dictionary, under three examples of whoopass, it's yeah. Uh, you've got you've got super super size, Dick Hughes. Yeah. Yeah. Then you've got Kim, and then you've got like just like as like that's the only guy I know who still rocks like he can rock a man bun with the long hair. Yeah, yeah. Steve Morris. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, 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 and you'd be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not knocking this guy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah legends. Yeah. yeah. So carry yeah. on. Yeah. Absolutely. So it became clear. So I taught, learned the same catters off all of them, and it's clear to me that there isn't. They're not the same. They don't do it the same way. So there isn't one. So. This professor told me to go to source. How do I do that? Because I've heard all this stuff. I've saw what Hagana put out as Bunkai, and I still don't believe he believes that stuff. I don't believe he believes it, but that's another story. So do we have, like a lot of Miyagi, Chocha Miyagi was the founder of Gojuru. Have we got his, his um, source? And we have, in the kata. And so DKK was, was an attempt to go back to source. So not just doing the cutter, nobody was asking why those cutter in that order. Nobody ever asked why that cutter is there. Why do we do it then? Why is it called this? Right? Because some are called, like, one of the cutters is called uh, Sansaru, means 36. Well, you know, another one, you know, you, you, it's called uh, Shisoshin, means people will say it means battling in four directions, right? Utter nonsense. What do you mean? No, because you've got to just say, what do you mean, four directions? Yeah. Well, they all, one, they all go in four directions, and what if he comes from over there? It's just nonsense. And, and a kata, imagine putting one together back in those days. It's your soul, isn't it? It's your life. Yeah. You're not going to do that. Create this amazing thing that you think gives all the secrets you're trying to convey 
to future generations and then call it Bob. Are you? You're not going to just, <laughs> you're not going to give it some shitty little name that has no meaning, right? Yeah. So that started that investigation. Why is this called Gigs I Day H? Why is it the first cat we teach? Then why is there a second one so similar, so similar that some go to cl clubs have actually just got rid of it because it's only got one move different? But actually, when I got deeper and deeper and deeper, it's only got two moves the same. Right. And, and, and that was it. So it's, it's building from source. And I'll be honest, not, not, not rejecting what people have been teaching me, but not accepting that. To find, I want to find, I want to find out what this is all about. And the third piece was someone said to me, you know, the founders, you can either look at them as if they're a genius or look at them as if they're an idiot. And either way, that's what you're going to find. And it's, and it's true. So I took the view, NLP does this, you take, you sort of, Neuro linguistic program. It does a thing where you you don't necessarily believe something, but you act as if you do, yeah. and it changes your percept perception on things. So, so I accept that Miyagi is the genius, and therefore why do? And it, it it's can it can't be just a little bit of a genius. It can't. Have, this is brilliant, but he's got Nikolash, this weird little bendy stance, which is shit. So yeah. I'm not going to do that. You can't do that. It means you have to find out what he meant. And 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 I'll be honest. I, I do believe that Miyagi would come and see DKK and say, this is great. But it wouldn't look what, what he did. And I believe that if it did look like what he did, it was, what the fuck have you been doing for 100 years? I did that. You know. it, 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 well, it's, it's so funny you said that because like, we're, from, we're both from the generation where um, principle-based training, like it was, it was like you were heretic. When you, you know, so you're not going to follow the kata. And I remember I used to say this to my karate instructor, my first karate instructor, and I love him like a father, Andy Margaret, and he did bunkai. And I used to say, but you're doing a square peg in a round hole here. And he was like, what? And I said, you're trying to make what we do in fresh air, like which looks cool, against somebody who doesn't want that to happen. And I went, if we just look at the principle, but you've got to remember this is back in the late 80s. And like, I'm a first stand. He's like, so who do you think you are, mate? You're like, you're, what, are you like Bruce Lee now? And I said, no, I'm looking at it, and it doesn't look like uh, there's any progression here. And then it was like, what do you mean progression? Original is still good. And I went, original is good, but the Model T is nowhere near as good as that Sierra Sapphire Cosworth I'm just poor. You know what I mean? And it was it, like the principles, as you were saying, when me and you first talked about it, you blew my mind, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to freak you out over this. Because when we talked about when you moved into MMA, which I'm going to have to assume that anyone who's watching this knows, uh, but I am going to just quickly give this, like, preface it with this. You, I, I truly believe, especially in the UK, you are the only guy I have ever seen take a so-called traditional martial art and put it into, not just, by the way, not just in MMA, because I know you've done it for real as well, um, you've taken the martial art and put it at the highest level, but like I'm referring to your MMA and how you did yeah. that. And I remember, I remember when we talked about it and I was like, so do you do much groundwork? And you just turned around to me like, and it was so straight the way you said it. You went, yeah, it's all in Goshen. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't look like any of the karate I did. And you went, no, no. it's all there, Mick. It's all there. And I was like, and I went back and I won't lie to you, you screwed my head up because I was like that going, <laughs> Have I walked away from karate too early here? Because like that's what I want to I want I want to get you on. So like, how did you manage to get something that was a square peg round hole scenario, which would be say goju, right? Yeah. And how did you get it to go into which is now the biggest, fastest growing sport in the world? And bear in mind, I should say you were the first guy and the only guy that I I really believe that we saw that switch from a martial art to now mixed martial artists because we don't see it anymore. And I know you posted recently, you got bored of watching mixed martial arts. Yeah. So that's the reason why I'm asking this. How did you get Goju Ru Karate? I know that's a big, long-winded thing, but I had to preface it. How did you get Goju Ru Karate into the cage and win? Okay, so, so I'm going to link those two things for you because first I want to go back to what a kata is and, and the, the, the big misunderstanding, which is to this day 
a kata is it's like it's like a lecture again i'll go back to uni because i learned so much about karate at university while not doing karate it was the only thing that i that really took out of it a kata is like a university a university a lecture right doesn't tell you what you need to know it tells you what you need to be studying and so does a kata so if you take goju I, I only know goju i don't you know i don't speak for karate i don't know i'm sure i'd find the same stuff if i looked in them but i don't know it goju starts with gegazai daich which means attack and smash number one and then it goes gegazai daini same name number two then cipher then seunchen so cipher means tearing tear and smash and seunchen means trapping battle and then your black belt so I will come back to your question, and this does link into it, because it, it's as if you came to me, Mick, and said, Gavin, listen, with no skills whatsoever, I said, Gavin, I've really, I've really fucked up. What's, what's the matter, Mick? I've got to have a fight in the docks on Wednesday. And I'm like, it's, it's Sunday night, Mick. Yeah. So what could I teach you? Okay. Um, what could I teach you in those couple of days and it's not a wrist lock is it it's not a, it's not even a punch what i have to teach you is that when the bell goes you're straight over and you smash you just fight with what god gave you tooth and claw i've got no time to give you skills just that's gigs our day itch. that is attack and smash number one so when students are in one of their learning gigs our day itch, they're doing push-ups till they can't do anymore they're doing punches on bag till they can't do anymore not skillful ones they're doing hill sprints that is gigs our day itch. Then gigs are die knee, the next kata, that is still attack and smash, but some positional advantage. You know, before you attack and smash him, you move. Whereas before, so you're straight down the pipe. So boxing is gigs are die knee. Cypher. Cypher means tearing. So the fight has come closer, and someone's now grabbed you, and you want to get away from them to put the fight back in the stand-up. Now, if you take the cage as an example, all the stand-up fighters, who I still maintain where you had in those early days first rate grapplers versus third rate strikers okay on a slippery man we'll come back to that. always um, uh, and it was chuck Liddell that figured it out because what happened was say you and i fought so you've got five years grappling i've got five years stand up we fight you win so i think shit i'm gonna go and do six months grappling so i come back six months later and we fight again i've got six months grappling you've got five years six months grappling and i lose again <laughs> it's just it's not going to win right that isn't going to work and it's chuck liddell that figured it out to frustrate grapplers not to try and grapple but to frustrate them and then knock them out that's cypher getting out of grabs and holes now the kata with the bonkai gives you a few examples but you're supposed to be studying getting out of grabs and holes for a year two years that's cypher that is that phase of training and then your last kata before black belt is called Seunchen, trapping battle. What else can it be? It's grappling. Trapping battle. What else can it be? And it's grappling. And then you spend your brown belts learning to grapple. So by the time you get to black belt, you've got a basic understanding. No more than that in all the areas of fight. There isn't any other range. There's nowhere else to fight. Anyway, so to your question, Neil Grove, a, a showdown of mine, a, a, black belt, a big guy, um, he wanted to test it. He wanted to go in the cage. And we'd been talking to uh, Cage Rage at the time. There was a thing called Cage Rage Contenders. And um, that was where you get a sort of, you know, we had a couple of fights in the cage to see how it went. And Neil was knocking people out. But then he was doing that. when I, That's how I met him, actually. I got a call from this nightclub where he was working saying, can you come and have a look at our door, door crew? We've got people knocking too many people out. And he just knocked out his supervisor. And I went down there and it was, it was um, Neil. And then he ends up trying it. But, um, yeah, so we've been thinking it. Then I get a call from Neil on a Thursday night saying, I've just had a call from Dave O'Donnell, and he, he wants me to fight at Wembley on Saturday against James Thompson. Remember the Pride Fire? Yeah, yeah, Colossus, yeah. No, well, yeah, yeah, Colossus. So, yeah, yeah. so Neil's had a couple of fights, but we haven't even got on contenders yet. So I said, no, we're not going to do that. And he, he pauses, he goes... I want to do it. I said, look, Colossus has been training for this fight. He was supposed to fight Kimo, I think. Yeah, yeah, Kimo Leopoldo. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. 
And, and obviously, it's too late. They've sold the tickets. They don't want to just have no fight. So they've got this big guy. Neil's just meet so that they don't cancel the fight, right? So I said, no, you shouldn't do it. And Neil says, I really want to do it. And I said, all right, we'll do it. So actually, I was away. I wasn't even going to be there. We were in a rehearsal. You'd make some music. I'm in a band with my brothers, Irish band. I was down in Southampton rehearsing for a gig next time. And Gary just said, just take my car and go. So I jumped into Gary's car, bombed up the M3, and got to Wembley at about thought half six, and Neil's all getting ready and bowled in. And I said, right, what are we doing? And Neil said, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to tire him out and take him in the second round. I said, no, you're not. I said, absolutely, you're not. He's been training for three months. What's wrong with you? This is gigs I die itch. This is my words. You're going over that cage like he stole your baby. <laughs> okay, and if you watch the fight, and, and Neil knocked him out in 10 seconds they had to bring oxygen yeah, yeah. into the cage. Neil storms over there, doesn't look like there's skill going on, but you know, the guy is unconscious after 10 seconds, so you know, you make your own luck, so to me. And, and that was it, that was that was that was uh, Neil uh, won that fight in 10 seconds, and then we had other other guys that wanted to fight in there, and, and we just I think our first 20 professional fights, we, we had 16 wins, most by knockout. And they but, but, never so, announced us as karate. They always, even from that first fight, announced us as background in the MMA, even though we'd have gi tops and belts on. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny it's really you say that, because after that, I don't know, did you ever watch any of James, James Thompson's fights after that? Yeah. Because yeah, because in Japan, he was known as Gong and Rush. Because in the pride fights, he did exactly what Neil Grove did to him. As soon as the gong went, he just yeah. rushed and tried to take him out. Uh, sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. Yeah. It was one of those. Well, anyway, as you were saying, you were never, ever mentioned as DKK. You were never mentioned as karate. It was just like you were lumped in as MMA. Now, you don't just have a black belt. It, you, it, you get the black gi, right, when you get, when you get your... Right. Your yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, famously, Masoyama, the Hundred Man Kumite, yeah, you heard about it, and I've seen a few times, I've heard versions of it. Yeah. But uh, I have to admit, the person who told me about your 30 man Kumite was the late great, often lamented, <laughs> Tony Pillage, who was quite well known to. Uh, well, hyperbole, and he, he would exaggerate sometimes. Yeah, he would. Me, I saw it, and I said, what was it like? And he goes, Mick, it was a fucking massacre. And I went, what? And he goes, oh, he, he said, trust me. He goes, it's 30 people, and he goes, and it's a fresh person every minute. So, And most of these guys that are doing it, they're grading too. So if they don't put it on whoever's doing the 30-man commentary, and I'm like, what? And he was telling me, and not like, you know, for my first stand, I fought everyone in the room. So I had pretty much the same thing, but it wasn't a lineup. You know, it was, it was completely different. So how did you come up with that concept or that idea to do a 30 man commentary? So, so it, it wasn't actually mine. So, so it, it, it goes back to, 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 to the investigation of, you know, the system and wanting to understand everything in the system. And and one of the other things that is a big problem in karate and why people aren't doing it anymore, quite rightly, is you're told that a showdown is a beginner's grade, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, otherwise it'd be called itchy dan, you know, itch itch nisan, yeah. right? Show means beginner. It's called beginner's grade. That's its name. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so the big problem is showdowns, leaving their associations, starting their own clubs without knowing. Because you said, did you leave too early? You might not yeah. have done, but they did, and they became teachers. Yeah. Um, so um, each each Dan grade is supposed to have its own area of study. It's not so you're not supposed to just do it again when you're older and fatter. It doesn't that makes no sense. <laughs> right. A fourth Dan isn't supposed to just be a slow fat first Dan. They're supposed to have studied other things and have different levels of skills. So with Goju Shodan is a generalist grade. You know, it shows you everything you've done. Then your knee Dan is a fighting grade, which is where our 30 man comes and I'll come back to it. Sandan is really about understanding the kata and the bonkai and how the system puts together because then you're a teacher level. Weapons grade is fourth down, fifth down, pulls everything together. 
So Nido always was a fighting grade, and it, it came out of, it always was a fighting grade. We did a fighting grade, but it wasn't formalized to such. And it's really about your, it's okay, you know, you know, the press always loves it when a, when a black belt gets beaten up in a car park, aren't they? Because they just yeah. perpetuate the myth that a black belt's a master, right? So that's a beginner just got beaten up. But your high grade should be tough. Now, I don't care what you do, but your, high, but your karate black belt should be able to fight and fight well. Yeah. So you can get to Shodan as a sort of technician, but you can't be beyond. With the 30 man, it means that you... To get beyond, to, to do the nice soft stuff that people want, the Jew of Goju, yeah, great. Yeah, do your 30, man. It's all there waiting for you. All that lovely stuff, all your chi, all your pressure point stuff, it's all waiting for you. But you have to really fight first. And this is to come back to Pillage, and I said this to him, because he found himself a nice little niche on, on pressure points and stuff. And I said to him, because he did know them, I said, the problem you've got, Tony, is you've got no delivery mechanism. You can't get anywhere near me. You couldn't get anywhere near me to deliver any of that, which he knew, because he hadn't done the hard stuff first, the go before the Jew, you know, um, because you need that delivery mechanism, which he understood, because he talked about the poison on the spear. He just did, you know, you've got a spear before, you know, you've got to have a spear, yeah. right? And you've got to be able to use it. So knee down is there to ensure that our high grades are tough. So it was always a fighting grade, but it was actually Nick Hughes that, that had in his system a 30-man kumite. And, and, and so that's really where uh, the, the idea of formalizing it, you know, because we just fought, we just kept fighting it over and over and over and over. But, but then when I did mine and all, all that stuff, we didn't know what the syllabus was at all. We didn't even know we were grading, which, which allows some level of fear, but very momentary. The way we do this is you're told exactly what to do. So, you know, red belt, first thing you're going to do is 10, no, second thing you're going to do is 10 push-ups. First thing you do is pay. And I make this very clear. So if you can't do your 10 push-ups, you're out. Yellow belt is 20 push-ups. Orange belt, 30, 40. So your first thing you do with your black belt is 100 push-ups. So because you do get quite close to your students, or at least you like some of them. Not a lot, but you like them. So... I don't want to be failing them arbitrarily. I want to say, well, you couldn't do your push-up, so how dare you turn up here unprepared? I've told you exactly what you had to do. You're taking a piss. Why, why are you even here? Whereas we didn't know that. We had an excuse. We, we didn't know we were going to have to do that. So I think it's much tougher to know what you have to do. With the 30 man, they spend basically a year training for it. And, and people have done interesting things to get ready. A lot, a lot wouldn't have been to Kyokushin. We've had some help from the Kyokushin who come in and help, and, and some go to Thai boxing. There was one guy who did stand-up comedy. I think I've mentioned this to you before. Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. And I'm like, that what? That thing he was scared of, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's his, that was his greatest fear. And, and it, when he did it, when he did it, and he's not a funny guy, <laughs> which is funny in itself, um, you know, he, he worked out what his was most frightening thing was, and we had a couple of guys do door work who were particularly not particularly suitable, but they did a year of door work, all mental preparation for this test. So when you walk onto the field of truth, which is our field, and you see 30 people lined up, 30 people is, looks a lot more than the number. It's a big line. And then when 15 of those are in black geese as well, meaning they've done it, it's a terrifying thing. And, and he's right. It is, it's not unusual to have people who are, I say audience, people sitting around that are watching it in proper tears, just weeping. And then yeah. uh, I, lo I looked. I looked at your grading syllabus, and it was like, "Oh yeah, uh, to get your black belt, you got to do six months on the door." And yeah. I'm like, what? And yeah. like, can you can you expand on that? Six months on the door for a black belt. Yeah, we do, we yeah. don't actually do that anymore. We don't actually do that anymore. That was that was in the in the early, early days of DKK. That's what we did, and. Um, Again, it's about being tough, and the reason we, we dropped it as a requirement is is that I had some very tough people that just didn't they didn't need or want to do that, and, and it was important to me that people put themselves on the line, but I don't know how, you know, as we got bigger, it just got unman unmanageable. You know, it got, we got too big to have that many people out there doing it. Um, but it, it, it set us off on the right foot, and in principle, I still really 
think it's an important thing. And because the, the important thing about doorway, it's like troops in Northern Ireland. You know, you don't have to actually see combat to to for it to harden you. The fear of it is goes a long way. And I say this to my own guys, that there should be fear in a dojo. And one of the things that's, that's tripped over from BJJ, apart from um, calling, you know, stuff that we used to have different names for, the mount and the guard, is this little hand-shaped fist pump there. I just won't have it. Because no. it's a way of bringing it down. It's a way of saying, okay, we're just messing. We're just rolling. Okay, well, this isn't a fight. That's so different from someone going, and squaring off to you. Because that's what the bow, the bow is a bookend, right? What I'm saying, when we bow before we fight, I'm saying that whatever happens between this bow and the next one stays between those two bows. We might be friends now, and we might be friends on the other side, but not now. Between these two bows, we're fighting. Yeah. And it doesn't move beyond this space. That's what it's to. So I want, don't go fist bumping. It's like people, when they're sparring, they're encouraging the guy who's sparring them. Stop that me! Just shut up. Like the 30 man. The last thing I want is someone fighting them and saying, yeah, come on. You're supposed to be scaring the living shit. You're supposed to be terrifying them. You, you, everyone in the dojo, and I've said this before, you should have times when you just can't come because you just can't face it because your courage fails you and you think, I just can't go in there. I've got to go. I'll, I could be home. Yeah. Not all the time. That would be too much. But that fear has to be present. Otherwise, you can't meld people. You can't... You can't, the dojo's not hot enough, the metal won't melt, right? Famously, you don't advertise, you don't no. teach children, right? So, no. right? so, literally, if we talk about expanding an organization, you do literally everything that these martial arts, mastery, life coaches, guys with their headsets, they've got their teeth done in Turkey, tell you we're going to change your life, right? And you do completely the opposite, and you've got a huge organisation. Is it just down to the fact that people want quality, or you know, authenticity, or what is it? I, um, I, I do a couple of things really. You, 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 you did mention traditional. You said traditional a little bit back there, and I, I was going to pick it up then. But the, the tra traditional, traditional is the tradition of 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 being effective. That's what's traditional. Isn't it? You know, nothing was traditional apart from being effective. So I, as I said, was a reluctant teacher in the first place. I have no desire for an empire in this whatsoever. I don't, I, I still am old school and I think that I shouldn't be out there asking for students. I think they should find me. And on our form, it says, one of the lines there is, why should I accept you as a student? And it always flummoxes people entirely. You know, why should? Because they're expecting to do all the rest. Why should I accept you as a student? And and you know the answers are always sort of a bit of nonsense, really. But it's just to get them to think, to put them in the right space to start with, as to why you think I should teach you. And I don't really. I, and I say that you you touched on this a little bit yourself earlier. When when some a new student does come in. I am more, much more friendly than Kim ever was. But I do say, okay, um, I'm not going to spend any time with you. Line up at the back, do what everyone else does, said, and if you're still here in three months, we'll talk. <laughs> and uh, I say to them, you've got nothing to prove to me. Yeah, you will have, but not now. You'll wait until you do. And, and, and that's it, off you go. And it's funny, I get... Quite a lot of karate and other instructors, not just karate, telling me that, you know, it used to be so much harder and, you know, you can't do it that way anymore. And I'm like, why not? And they said, well, you just can't get the students. I said, well, I've got like 10 times more students than you and I'm doing it hard. You know, it's hard because it's what people want, right? No, who ever wanted it to be, I mean, people call it elitist now, but elitist is, that's like a, it's like socialism in America. How did that become a bad word? You know, how did yeah. that become a negative term? Yeah. It's not. Exactly. I'm not elitist. Uh, karate is open to everyone, but not everyone can achieve it because not everyone's w willing to give what it takes. So I really have just maintained, and I, 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 I don't, you'll never hear me saying we had it tougher in our day. You could, you could 
get Scotty to beam any of my black belts back into my day and they would still be doing exactly what we did, if not better. Authenticity, as I said, it's funny because every time I speak to anyone about you, and your name comes up, they go, he's a real deal, you know. And it, and it, again, it's, it's funny because, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, karate has a really, really bad rap now. And it kills me because I'll tell you right now, and I'm still, I I'm, I'm maintain this, I'd put stand-up, I would put Wayne Otto or Vic Charles at their peak in that arena against anyone, right? But on the streets, I would put Steve Morris or Peter Urban, if we just use two guys, two goju guys, you know, I'd I put them up against anybody. So, so, yeah. so, so, you know, pardon my French, but what the fuck happened? Was it just everything got diluted? And because. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. And, and I used to sort of struggle with it, with, you know, some of the sort of McDojo stuff. It used to annoy me, and it doesn't ignore me, and it doesn't anymore at all because. You know the, the bell curve, the bell distribution curve? Yeah, Are you familiar yeah. with that? So that basically says that, you know, there's this curve. You're going to have a few people that are really good, a few people that are really shit, and everyone else is average. And that's true of everything, right? That's true of everything. So it's always been this way. You know, it's always been mostly rubbish. Almost all of everything is bit rubbish. And this is why you'll never hear me or see me posting up videos of someone or, or some group that's rubbish, you know. It doesn't mean I don't think they're rubbish, but, you know, like I said, you know, Liverpool don't spend their time trawling the internet to find, you know, little clips of, of Sunday league footballers putting it up on their site saying, look at these guys, that's not even football. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to me what they're doing. But the reason it got rubbish was Shodan's teaching. If I had set up as a Shodan, I probably would have dropped Nick Wash. I don't know if you know the stance, but there's some stances. Yeah, might yeah, have not been done. Stance, yeah. yeah, yeah, I probably would have dropped it because I didn't understand what it was for. You know, I couldn't see that. But now I totally understand what it's for. It's utterly essential. But there's loads of stuff I didn't understand. And, 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 and so what you've got is those Shodan who broke away getting up through the grades, but they've still got showdown level. And it comes back to what I said, you know, you're supposed to have a different understanding of things that need Dan, not just be doing the same stuff, because you can't do it as well. You know, if you think about um, sort of your route to black belt and trying to have a power, 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 I want to be able to knock you out, right? Because, because if I can knock you out, I don't even have to be the best fighter. I just need to get to you. If I can take a bit of a hit, this is go to Heartlands, right? If I can take a bit of a hit, I just need to get to you. I don't even have to be a better fighter than you. I know I can knock you out, right? That's 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 where confidence comes from. Not not teaching confidence. Yeah. Give people power. Then post black belt, what I want to see then is how little can I do to knock you out? I'm not just trying to get power exponentially. I've got it. How lit now? What what little amount can I do to <laughs> knock you out? So again, so you're not doing the same thing. You're not just trying to get more powerful at 60 than you were at 20. It just makes no sense. And so karate has got a very bad rep for good reason. But the reason, the real answer to your question in my book is karate doesn't exist. Okay, there is no such thing. There is nothing that you can tell me that is definitely karate. That doesn't exist in other styles. There is nothing. What does exist is... Goju exists. Shotokan exists. Okay, but karate doesn't exist. You said earlier about uh, you used to do karate and you still sort of do. In my book, you absolutely do. You are doing empty hand. Karate, empty hand is an umbrella term which incorporates jiu-jitsu, MMA, judo. All of that stuff is, to my book, is karate. It's empty-handed training. That's what it is. And then beneath that, you've got the delineation of what it is. The only... A style, right? Goju. Is, the only thing a style is, is a difference of opinion on how to, to do the same thing. So when we went into the cage, people were saying, that doesn't look like karate. They said, well, what, what do you mean? What were you expecting to see? You want to, you're expecting to see our training mechanisms, like kata. That's a training mechanism. Yakuski. This, this, there's no, this karate punch, this bomb. That's, that's not a punch. You know, the conversation about, because don't forget the Japanese had boxing back in the day and they had fights. They know what fights were. So, so somebody said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to take out all these 
all these punches that we know work and put this one in and argue for 100 years about whether it works or not. That conversation never <laughs> happens, right? So this here, this, this concept of pulling back here, this thing, and, and if I just push it, if I'm going, that's a push, okay? I have to get that my tetic reflex, the stretch reflex, boom, that is what we're trying. That's what this is training. The end bit of fist is not, it's that, boom. That's what we're training. And by that, you're training your trigger. So a punch has got three phases, right? Trigger, free flight, and impact. Free flight, you need to hit something. Your body won't allow you to punch in the air and not do it. It won't allow you to damage. So it trains the trigger, and then the impact's done on makawara pads and people. But what you're really trying is this, boom, this, this trigger. And then that is all of your punches. It's a trigger for all of your punches, not just this one. It's a shortcut, right? So there's one example where you've got people going on thinking that's a punch. So karate doesn't exist. There's no such thing. And when people said that doesn't look like karate, what they wanted to see was our training mechanism. But what they actually saw was the result of our training mechanism. The fight will always look the same. In order... In order of word association, if I was going to mention you, right? First of all, the first thing I would say, just the diamonds, because you, you, you've been you've always been great whenever we've met, all right? But these are the things that I immediately think of you. First of all, karate. Secondly, whiskey. Then shillelaghs. Then music, right? Like, I, I'm going to let the guys into a little bit of a secret. The last time I actually rang you was just before lockdown. Do you remember? I had a free time. Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. But it was like, in typical Mick Tully style, uh, Eddie Quinn had rang me and he goes, mate, I can't go see the Jockey Murphy's. We're down at, it's down at Ali Pally. Do you know anyone who's going to be up for it? And I went, the only person I know down that neck of it is Gavin Moore Holland. He'll be up for it. I rang you and yeah. you couldn't make it. But, right. it, it was, it, but it was bizarre because I wouldn't have known anything about yeah, especially your musical skills again through pillage because first of all finding out that you're in a band and then secondly when you sang the part in glass and you remember and you turned around to me like you walked away and I, I, do you remember because you were quite emotional it was, uh, it's, uh, it's yeah. and you went, i don't even know why i did that and it was really good because it was a proper moment you know, it just seemed like the right thing to do so tell yeah, me yeah I don't, I don't remember that conversation no i, I, I do remember doing the song though yeah yeah, but when we came out of it, you were like that guy. I don't know why I did that. But yeah. like, it was one of those moments. How did you? So music is it the Irish thing or what? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so like I said, we left we left uh, Ireland and and went to Scotland for five years in Scotland and moved down to England. So I don't know what I was ten, nine, ten, eleven, something like that. But we didn't have a TV until we got to England. But there was instruments everywhere, just laying around. So. We all kind of played everything. So I say it's a band, but it's my brothers. We, we just play it. And we, we didn't even have a, a proper name for a long time. We used to play under a different name every time we played. And we're called the Watch Snatchers. Yeah. And that came about. Uh, that came about. I mean, we, we had some of the One name we played under was something like Flattery Slattery and his 12 piece orchestra that John had just come up with. And then there's four of us, and they were quite upset by it. But uh, we did. We were playing this one gig up in Derbyshire, I think it was. And uh, just before we we started, Mike snapped a string on his mandolin. So he goes, "Right, tell a joke." Oh. So I said, "What's the difference between uh, a pickpocket and a peeping tom?" One of them snatches watches. And the next day in <laughs> the next day in the Derbyshire Times, they called us the Watch Snatchers, and it stuck. Right. So we just kept it. So the watch snatchers, that's how that came about. So, so yeah, it's, it's, we, we, we play a fair bit. We played a couple of gigs up in Sheffield last weekend, a couple of down Southampton, the one before. Yeah, we play a bit, but it's not, you know, we don't take it too seriously. It's, it's drinking music. It's, it's what it is, mate. What, what it is, and this is an, another little bit of a gift, I think, because of the type of music it is. It's, it's for people who, have had a bit of a hard time or they've had a shitty week and all their troubles, it's a bit like training, you know, all your troubles are still going to be there when we finish, but for two hours we can lift that. We can lift that off them for a couple of hours and they're going to bang their feet and drink more than they thought they were going to and, and, and so are we. And that's just brilliant. Well, you see, this is the thing. I've, I don't know uh, about yourself, but as I've got older, 
uh, my appreciation of, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not working for the Irish Tourist Board here, but there's certain things like, uh, again, I have to quote you on this. Uh, I, I mentioned to you that I'd started drinking whiskey, and you were like, "How old are you?" And do you, I don't know if you remember this. How old are you? And I was like, I said. 51, he goes, yeah, about right, about right. He goes, got a member, it's a man streak. And it was so funny the way you said it, because you're like, no, you wouldn't appreciate it. You won't appreciate it as a young man. And then it was that whole thing where it was like, yeah, it's a sipper. And it was like, what? And you're like, got to appreciate it. If you go through the Facebook, because we were chatting on Facebook, yeah. and, said it, and you went, no, no, he goes, because you can't gulp that down. He goes, you put coke in it. You know, what are you, Philistine? And it was really good. It was like, no, you sit there, you've got to gather your thoughts. And it's a, it's a drink that makes you think. And it's uh, it makes you think some mad things as well if you are a Catholic. But uh, the, the, with the KD music, especially what I found as I've got older, KD music and country music, again, it's that uh, make me sound like an old fart here now. But it's like you know when you you know when you start reading Hemingway and you go, yeah, <laughs> I, I I get you now, Ernie. I get where you're coming from. Like you listen to Johnny Cash and you're like, yeah. But it's a good thing. Life life is. It's just brilliantly designed, right? So when you're 20, you want to go to clubs and stuff. And, and then when you're our age, you can't think of anything worse. You know, it's not that you still want to go and don't, right? It's you want to do something else. And what they always forget is that you've already done it, right? And so if pop music really is teenage music, the only love they talk about is, is you know, male, female, teenage love, and, and rightfully so. But country music and Irish music, they talk about life. They talk about you losing the farm. They talk about you losing your job. They talk about your struggles in life. They talk about your love for your children or your love for your parents, not just male, female love. You know, that's why it's, it's, you need to be older to appreciate it because you need to have done those things. And it can only be written and sung by people that have done it, which is why Johnny Cash and the like are just kind of, you know, you can feel it. You, can't, you couldn't get a teenager singing that stuff, right? And that's the beauty of, of, of an Irish band like ours, is the more, the older and more craggy you are, the better, right? Yeah, so. well, but, it, but it's the truth. Again, it's like, you know, just as you're saying it, I'm like, I remember seeing Van Morrison back in the 90s, and he was curmudgeonly then, and he pissed me off. But now I'm like that going, I get this, you know, you'll turn up and go, I'm getting 950,000 to be here tonight, but I'd rather be at home watching Only Fools and Horses, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's mm -hmm. like Christy, Christy Moore's another great example. Yeah. And again, when, when you listen to these guys, you go, and, I, I, and again, it ju yeah, just as you're saying it, and you're saying about the music and the, I, I think that's in like literally every culture, you know, it's the, where, where we used to venerate the elders, now we don't. You know, it's like, you know, you're sitting around and you're just listening to guys telling you stories. Yeah. And then you go, why is he saying that? You go, well, so that, I don't, you, so that you don't have to live that life. Right, you know right. I mean? And, that, and it, so, it, I mean, that's what folk, essentially that's what folk music, again, folk music got a bad name because of English folk, which is just dire. But Irish folk's great. But that's, that's what it is, you know. And, and so, this is all kind of, that's all basically whiskeys there. All different sorts that people have got, and and just you know, it's it's an appreciation of something. It takes it takes time to become like that. Yeah. I, I was up in I was up in Scotland a couple of years ago, and we went to the Glenfiddich place. And and what I didn't realise was, you know, age ten years, twenty, thirty, forty. The reason it only gets to a certain age, like thirty or something, is because there's none left. It's the because it evaporates, and not because they drink it, but it evaporates from the barrel. So. Yeah. There's only so much you can get out of a barrel at 30 years. It, it, 60 years, there isn't going to be any left. So there isn't a 60-year-old whiskey. And just that, I, I remember once sitting by the pyramids in Egypt, looking at them, just thinking, everything I've ever done, everything my dad did, everything his dad did, everything I've ever read about, everything that's in the Bible, everything that's ever been written, these things were sitting there. And that was brilliant. And I think a little bit of that with the whiskey. You know, you pick that up, and this this was in put in the barrel before I was born, or when I was here, when I was there, and, and that goes into your into the drop you pour on the ground because you put one on for your ancestors. Yeah, well, you see that, that again. It's that thing that got me because I was looking at it, going, just the level of patience, which again it, it ties in really nicely mm. to martial arts, which is I um. I, I, 
you, you know, just seeing that, you've got this great collection of whiskies behind you, right? And in your 20s, all you needed was a bad week and go in there, demolish one or two of them, like, you know, ru ruin your whole week. And now you're looking at it and you've got the respect for it there. And you've yeah. got the patience because you know well, you've got it. And it goes back to that sentence what I was saying about surround yourself with people that know better than you do because nobody in the history of the world has picked up a whiskey and thought this is lovely first time or a beer for that matter. You know, but there's people that people better than me that say this is great stuff. So I'm going to persist with it until eventually you think this is great. You know, and I'll do that with anything. I'll do that with anything uh, that, that, that enough people think this is great. I want to... I want some of that. If someone says this is brilliant, whatever it is, me saying no, it isn't, doesn't enhance me in any way. What I need to do is get to where they are and think, do you know what? That is brilliant. Or eventually say, no, it's not. But it's never a wasted journey, right? Well, it, but it's exactly right. Because you're thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's uh, another, uh, another great character, whiskey aficionado, Steve Lowe, right? And you know, Steve's yeah. like, yeah, a great yeah. bloke, and, and he's he, like he's a like works on a building site, carpenter. Yeah. Like he teaches teaches karate, and he's like, oh, why don't you do it for a living? And he's like, like you, if I did it for a living, I might fall out of love with it. I don't ever want to find that out. And we were talking about whiskey, and I said to him, I went, man, I, I, I went I went over to when I was over in Osaka, I had a couple of Centauris over there, and I won't lie to you. What I did initially was I just went pure Japanese businessman. Fired a load of beer down my neck, went to a karaoke bar, and then I saw an advert for a highball. And I went, While I'm here, I've got to try one. Had one, and it was really nice because it was a highball. And then I went into an Irish bar, and uh, the guy who owned it, it was one of the typical Japanese Irish bar, by the way, on the seventh floor of a skyscraper. When you walked in, <laughs> yeah. walked in there, and it was like walking, walking that in off O'Connell Street, you know what I mean? And walked in, and of course, all the Americans were like, don't worry, we've got our own Irish guy there. But the thing was, I'd only buried my dad two days previously, right? And I went in, and they were like, what are you here for? And I said, oh, martial arts thing, where are you from, County Cavern? And asked about my parents, and I said, well, actually, we just, we just like, had my dad's funeral two days ago. And it was so funny, because the bloke, I'd only met him, like, what, 20 minutes earlier? He went, how many of your mates with you? And I went, well, that's quite a lot. It's about 30 of us. And he went, how many of them do you really, really like? And I went, I like them. <laughs> he goes, you've got, to pick, you've got to pick another nine. And I went, okay. And he goes, but don't bring any Philistines. That was his exact words. Don't bring any Philistines. Meet me at the bottom of the bar. Went down to the bottom of the bar and he pulled out. And bear in mind, it's to us, it's just manufactured. But it's such a great story because... My dad, his name was Paddy, and his favourite whiskey was Paddy Whiskey. And yeah. as we rock up, go to the end of the bar, he pulls out a bottle of Paddy Whiskey, and he's got, and he goes, the problem is, he goes, this is about £30 a shot over here. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the bar, he said, what was your dad's name? And I went, Paddy. And then as he was going out, he goes, where is he from? And I went, County Cavern. And he went, we're drinking Paddy Whiskey for a mean bastard from Cavern. And we threw it down the neck. But it was really bizarre because it was one of those moments where I looked at it and I was like, my dad would be so stoked to know yeah. that, like 15,000 miles away in a country that he doesn't, he doesn't even really understand, but they're toasting him. And the guy was like, and how do you feel? And I was like, you know, again, it was one of those, as you get older, I'd never lost anyone close to me. And yeah. then obviously I lost my dad. And then, and we had a problematic relationship, but it was... You know, without getting too heavy, you know, it's like you view your your relationship with your parents through the lens of your own children and that. It's only when you become a father that you look and go, he must have looked at me like this at least once in his life. And then you become the forgiving individual, you know what I mean? But, yeah. it, was so but it was great because the reason I said that whole story was how shit would that story have been if I said, yeah, I went there and he got 10 bottles of Budweiser out for us. You know yeah, what right. I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like the worst story. Ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to wrap it up with this. If, if you had anything, right, uh, if there was any other martial art that you could have done, what would it have been? That's, that's interesting. That is an interesting question. So I, I, I do have a love for judo. I love the honesty of judo. I love the fact they don't 
they never got into the self-defense bullshit. They they talk about themselves as judo players, and they're tougher than than, than the rest of us. Generally speaking, it's just yeah. or it was. I BJJ, you know, people say basically just judo. Judo got taken out by the Olympics, right? And it created this vacuum. And BJJ rushed in to fill it quite rightly. And I guess if I was starting now. I might be doing that. I, I think I don't know any, of anything as complete as Goju. And I think I might be doing two things, but I, I heartily disagree with. That was good. Uh, Mick is. He said he's trying to get in. <clears throat> is that all right, Will? Excellent. Um, just trying to get Mick. There he is. Cool. Hey. And that, oh, superb. I wish we could keep on going or come back and do some more. Because um, that was. This is for me what uh, I like about martial arts, um, proper proper martial arts. Um, we're, nice we're, we're back in. Well, we are back in. Yes. So we, we just we'll just go for, from go to if you just say go to and then we'll be able to go from there, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so go to. So um, I see so it sort of changed me over the year when I I've, there was an article I had published I think in Combat Magazine if you remember Combat. It was the yeah. first one I wrote maybe. 30 years ago, and it was basically saying karate is all about fighting. It's not about anything else. And I don't agree with that anymore. But I'm not ashamed of the article because that's what it meant to me then. It was my truth at the time as a second Dan. That was my truth. So now I don't, I think there's about, I know it's about a lot more than that. So if I was to do something else, I want, you know, if it's about fighting, it needs to be stand up. You know, you need to, it needs to be stand up. I think I probably would do BJJ now later on. I like the concept of tapping out. You know, you can't tap out of a thigh kick. It's too late. You know, you, you can't tap out from a punch in the head. Um, and so the pace of that is is, is kind of good. Um, uh, some of the, the, the Kung Fu's are interesting, but too, they've gone too flowery. You know, some of the Okinawa stuff is interesting, but it's too clunky. It's a hard one, you know, and, and I, I don't really think I speak from a, from a position of, of great knowledge as to what I'd be doing because I don't know, you know, I can only speak as a goju guy. And interestingly, I don't even consider myself a goju guy. I do say to my students, if I saw something better, I would be in here tomorrow saying, I'm doing this. You can come with me or not. I would I would drop it in a heartbeat if I saw something better. Absolutely. 100%. But well, you see, it's, it's funny you say that because um, that's why I follow Dan in Osanto for the simple yeah. reason. He's so open minded and it was like the classic. Like you, you go on, you go. On, it, believe it or not, if you go on the internet now, you'll find guys arguing about Jeet Kune Do and say, "What did Bruce really think?" And you're like, "He was a 32 year old man." I, like this is coming from a 53 year old man. Most 32 year old men that I know, I don't want to spend more than 10 minutes with them anyway. You know what I mean? Because they just haven't woke up yet. You know what I mean? But it's uh, again that with 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 Guru Dan, it's like, do it. See, I, I think that's a good point, actually. I don't know. I think that's what I would do. If I could do it with my knowledge now, it, I would follow a person, not a style. It would be a person I'd try with. And I don't think you can get better than... Yeah, but, yeah, but unfortunately, Gavin, one that we're going to have to expand on for the simple reason that, uh, yeah, Bob Breen, Rick Young, Terry Barnett, Rick Fay, yeah. guys like that, uh, it's all down from that trickle down from, like, from Dan in Osanto, because, you know... He, yeah. If you're going to follow a man, follow a great man. You know? Yeah, right. But, but but there's not many of them. I'm gonna we're gonna wrap up on this because I want to get you again. I want to get you if possible because uh, I'd like to just do musings where me and you just talk about life, the universe, anything, <laughs> right? But I'm gonna yeah. go out on I'm gonna go out on the Gavin Gavin Moore Holland quote where we uh, we interacted this week on Facebook and I said, "Where's the honor and integrity in martial arts?" and it, the legend that Gavin is, he went, it don't exist in martial <laughs> arts, mate. He goes, oh. it don't exist. Uh, but it's, like, the, the thing is, 
I still believe in all of that. And maybe yeah. just maybe I'm deluding myself. But well, no, you that. you can put it in me, but it has to start with you because it doesn't. It's not external. It's not there as a thing. You could put it in. Yeah, but it's down yeah. to us to put it in if there's anything there. But it, it it's not based on the name karate is is a uh, you know the foundation of karate is basically racist and definitely xenophobic. You know, <laughs> it used to be called it was called Tode, right? It was called China Hand. It was in the run up to the to, to Japan invading uh, China. They didn't want any positive association with China, so they changed it to empty because it looked and sounded the same. You know, there's no bold, great sort <laughs> of ethical underpinning to the name. They just were about to attack China. The, and dear viewers, the reason why I actually do love Gavin Mulholland is he's a more erudite and eloquent version of me. He just turned around and said karate is xenophobic and racist and has got away with it. People would go, I totally agree with you, Gavin. Where it was, but they were like, that makes funny. What is he on about now? But Gavin, it's been wonderful talking to you. It's just so, it's so nice to speak to a like-minded individual. It's like, as like Will always says, all we want to do is we're in this to, you know, when you're speaking to someone and you come out of it and you go, I actually learned something there. You know, it's like stuff that really affects you, especially as you get older. You know, we, we need to start exploring the real good topics. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anytime, so mate. My pleasure. Anytime. God bless. You're okay. welcome. Thanks, man.